Okay, I see you. Well, welcome everybody to part three of the crash course in the Constitution, otherwise known as Constitution 101. Um, it is uh, a wonderful day in eastern Kansas today, so we don't have the wood burning stove fired up. It actually crossed 80 degrees in our neck of the woods. So it's, uh, it's really nice. Been outdoors today and uh, it's been terrific. Um, anyway, so for those of you who are just joining us, uh, this is a, <clears throat> and haven't seen the uh, Con Law part, Con Law Constitution, Crash Course on the Constitution parts one and two, uh, this is a Crash Course in the Constitution from a former law professor, yours truly, uh, who used to teach the Constitution in two semester long courses. And I've tried to condense the essential parts <clears throat> or the most important parts down uh, into something that we can do in about three hours. And this is hour number three. Uh, we'll take questions toward the end of this uh, video, um, this Facebook Live video. My daughter Molly is going to be fielding the questions again. Molly's right here in the room with me. And uh, we will be taking any questions. So if you have questions, you can actually uh, jot them down now as we're uh, and, and, and post them in the um, in the little window with the Facebook app as we're going along. So um, to, to review where we were as of parts one and part two, uh, part one, we talked about the basic principles of the United States Constitution, the, enum the principle of the enumerated powers, uh, the fact that the state governments are governments of police powers. They have all the residual powers that were not given to the federal government in 1787. And uh, we also talked about the commerce power of Article One, Section 8, which is the principal power that Congress has relied on, uh, especially in the 20th century, to do just about everything under the sun. Uh, then in Part 2, we talked about the Second Amendment, and we also talked about the Establishment Clause. And now in part three, we're going to talk about the spending power and we're going to talk about the abortion cases. And this, by the end of this, you'll have a pretty good sense, I think, of where the Supreme Court has taken the Constitution away from its original meaning, where things have started to correct themselves, and just how powerful the Supreme Court has made itself in uh, basically amending the Constitution without the consent of we the people. Under the guise of interpreting the Constitution, the Supreme Court has actually been changing the Constitution, especially uh, the Brennan Court, uh, or, or the, the court led, uh, intellectually led by Brennan, um, but uh, the, the court in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, but things definitely improved uh, in the 80s, 90s, and uh, since the turn of the centuries. Um, so uh, let's talk about the where we're going right now. And let's see if I have my notes. No, I brought the wrong, oh, here we are. Okay, the taxing power and the, uh, <clears throat> and the abortion cases. Okay, so um, let's quickly talk about the commerce power. So the commerce power, which we discussed in part one, is without question the power that Congress has relied upon the most and has, has stretched beyond the constitutional boundaries the most. But there is another power that Congress has relied upon less frequently, but has the potential to be abused even more than the commerce power has been abused by Congress. And that is the taxing power. Um, the taxing power is found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, and it reads as follows. The Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, end quote. Now for the 50, first 150 years of the Constitution, the taxing power was no greater than what the framers intended it to be, simply a, an authorization for Congress to raise revenue by imposing taxes. Um, but in the progressive era, some progressive attorneys came up with the idea of using tax penalties and tax incentives to engage in social engineering and to penalize undesirable behavior and reward desirable behavior. In other words, to start using the taxing power to regulate. And one of the big causes of the first 20 years of the 20th century was the child labor movement. Now, child labor is obviously something that was uh, an evil and was something that was, you know, we need the country needed to end. And, and it was really the movement to end child labor it goes all the way back to the 1830s. Um, and it would ultimately uh, culminate in the 1930s. 
but most of the states, by the time, uh, by the turn of the 20th century, most of the states had already eliminated child labor. State by state action was working. Well, Congress, once progressives assumed power in both the uh, Democrat Party and the Republican Party, they decided, hey, we're going to get Congress in the game. Even though the states clearly have the authority to do this, we think we can use the commerce power. And so they uh, passed a regulation uh, banning products made from child labor uh, and sorry, not banning them, but penalizing the making of products from child labor. And uh, this was done through the exercise of the commerce power. The Supreme Court correctly struck it down, saying, no, this isn't we Congress doesn't have the authority to regulate products and the means of production. And pre-1937, no Supreme Court had opinion had held that. This was before the switch in time. And then literally within a week after the Supreme Court striking down the Child Lab Labor Act regulation, Congress came right back with a child labor tax and said, okay, well, we'll just impose the same standards with a tax. And that case went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1922 in the case of Bailey versus Drexel Furniture. <clears throat> And again, remember, this is the pre-1937 Supreme Court. The court is trying to adhere to the original understanding of the Constitution. And the Supreme Court struck down the child labor tax and said, in so many words, look, Congress, you don't have the authority to regulate this under the commerce power. You can't just pass the same regulation and call it a tax and do the same thing. And uh, this was uh, the court said, look, this is only a tax nominally. What this really is, is a regulatory penalty. And the court found that, quote, its prohibitory and regulatory effect and purpose were palpable, uh, end quote. And it noted that there were scienter requirements, which is a, 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 a term we use in criminal law, which is that you, the person acted willfully. Um, and the court said that there is a distinction between taxing for fiscal purposes, which was a permissible exercise of the taxing power of Article 1, Section 8, and taxing for regulatory purposes to impose a regulatory penalty, which was not permitted. And the court said, this is the line. If you're taxing just to raise money, that's okay. That is constitutional. But Congress, if you start using the taxing power to regulate people, that's not okay. And so that distinction held for another 30 years. Well, it started to erode after 1937, but it held for, for a few more decades. But then by the time we hit 1953, the much more activist court um, began to change things. Just like they had in 1937, expanded the commerce power, they also expanded the taxing power. And the case I wanna focus on here was the 1953 case of United States versus Carriger. And the law in question there was the occupational tax provision of the Revenue Act of 1951. Now you wouldn't know what that was all about based just on the title, but it levied a 10% tax on all people engaged in the business of accepting wagers. It also imposed an annual fee of $50 and required all individuals accepting wagers to register with the IRS. Now at that time, uh, wagering and gambling were already illegal uh, in almost every state, uh, although such bans were not always strictly enforced. So oddly, Congress was laying, on, laying a tax on behavior that was already illegal. And Congress was under the pretense of exercising its taxing power, really just trying to put a federal uh, prohibition on gambling on top of the state prohibitions on gambling that already existed. Um, and it was clearly Congress was getting into a an area that it just didn't have the authority to regulate. It was, it was clear to everyone, including the more liberal members of the Supreme Court, that Congress did not have the power to go in and regulate gambling, that there was nothing that could be uh, stretched in the Constitution to say they had that power. Um, but they tried this tax. Congress said, well, we'll just impose a tax on gambling and that, that way we can regulate it at the federal level, even though the, con the Constitution doesn't expressly give this power to us. Well, unfortunately, the court voted six to three to sustain the, uh, the, the tax on gambling in the Carger case. But Justice Jackson also, he virtually dissented. He, he wrote a separate concurring opinion saying he was so dissatisfied with this. And uh, he, he said that this was a, to, you, to paraphrase his words, he said something like, this is a, a regulatory measure wrapped in the verbal cellophane of a tax. And therefore it's clearly um, a regulation. Uh, but Justice Reed wrote the majority opinion and basically the Supreme Court abandoned the Bailey versus Drexel furniture standard of it's either a tax to raise revenue or it's got penalties and it's a regulation. And said, look, anytime there's a, a plausible, even a minuscule, amount of revenue raised, that's good enough. Congress can call it a tax and use its taxing power. 
Um, so banning gambling, the court recognized was the primary purpose of the act, not raising revenue. But as, as Jackson admitted uh, in concurrence, this is a diff, and I'm going to quote him here. Justice Jackson said, this is difficult to regard as a rational or good faith revenue measure, despite the deference that is due Congress. On the contrary, it seems to be a plan to tax out of existence the professional gambler whom it has been impossible to prosecute out of existence by the states, of course, end quote. So, and everybody knew that the court in the arguments, the government conceded that it raised virtually no revenue. This was, to, to, if you paid the tax, you were basically admitting that you were breaking the relevant state criminal laws against gambling. Um, Justice uh, Frankfurter, I, I, I'm sorry, I said earlier, it was Jackson who said the, uh, the verbal cellophane. It was Justice Frankfurter in his dissent. He said, this is a gambling control wrapped in the verbal cellophane of a revenue measure. And so uh, the, the problem with this expansion of the taxing power that occurred in the 1950s is that uh, Congress has was now assuming the power to regulate in areas that Article One, Section 8 didn't give Congress. In other words, Congress can tax anything. The taxing power doesn't contain any subject limits, right? So if Congress wants to tax your income, they could. If they want to tax um, the income of people who engage in certain behavior or the income of people who engage in other behaviors, they can. The taxing power doesn't have any topical limits, uh, subject limits. And that means that they can regulate anything if they are allowed to use taxes to regulate. So that old line that the Supreme Court was holding correctly in Bailey versus Drexel Furniture suddenly vaporized. And Katie barred the door. If Congress recognizes what power it has in the taxing clause, because the Supreme Court has misinterpreted the Constitution uh, in the 1950s and onward, uh, then it's extraordinary. You, what the framers feared, which is a a police power in the hands of the federal government, a general power to regulate the health, safety, and welfare of the people would suddenly come into existence, even though the Constitution does not contain a federal police power. Um, and in fact, I started teaching this at UMKC Law School in 1996, and I, I taught the Carragher case, and I warned 24 years ago that someday Congress was going to discover that it had this taxing power and that it really could regulate anything under the sun by calling it a tax and just imposing a tax penalty. And I remember I used to teach my law students, I tried to come up with bizarre hypotheticals. Well, could, could Congress, and I would ask my law students this, could Congress regulate this? Could Congress regulate marriage by taxing certain things? Could Congress uh, regulate education by imposing certain taxes? And I would try to come up with all these examples, but one I never tossed at them because it just it never occurred to me that Congress would be so um, so blatant and obscene in its use of the taxing power. I never suggested that Congress might try to regulate our health care system through the use of a tax. But of course, that's exactly what happened. Fifteen years later, I was proved correct. Uh, and, and that's what the Supreme Court held in, in um, uh, NFIB versus Sebelius, National Federation of Independent Businesses versus Sebelius in the Obamacare case. Congress had finally seized on this power, this taxing power, and was using it with dangerous, unconstitutional uh, effect. Um, so now let's jump to the, the final case I want to talk about in taxing, NFI versus Sebelius. The case was decided in 2012. Many of you watching are undoubtedly familiar with it, or at least somewhat familiar with it. This was the Obamacare case. Um, and, and remember, the majority opinion is written by Chief Justice Roberts, and, the, and we talked about this in the Commerce Power section. The majority opinion correctly held that the commerce power does not allow Congress to regulate people who are declining to purchase health insurance and force them to purchase health insurance. You're trying to regulate someone who is not in Congress. It's not a regulation of commerce to regulate this person. Uh, but the Justice Department kind of laid in the briefing of the case said, well, hey, maybe we can defend, this is the Obama Justice Department, maybe we can defend this thing as a taxing power because after all, Congress did impose a penalty in the form of a tax. That, and, and many of you will remember this, the Obamacare tax, which was thankfully removed uh, by the Trump tax cut, the Obamacare tax penalty was give or take 700 bucks if you didn't uh, purchase health insurance. And so uh, the majority correctly found, can't use the commerce power to justify uh, Congress's assertion of authority under the Affordable Care, Health Care Act, but maybe, uh, but what about the taxing power? And this is where Chief Justice Roberts uh, switched. He joined, instead of joining with the conservative originalist justices, he then 
switched over and joined with the liberal activist justices, the four liberal activists, and created a separate 5-4 majority saying that <clears throat> Obamacare was sustainable, was justifiable as an exercise of the taxing power. So in, in this, this was such a, a huge mistake by Justice Roberts, uh, and it, it just showed you know, and it disappointed originalists like us all around the country. Um, but it also showed, I think, a sort of a lack of, of, the, of understanding. Of course, he understands the big picture, but a lack of concern for the big picture here. Because if, if Congress has the authority to regulate health insurance purchasing through the taxing power, they can regulate just about anything through the taxing power as long as they phrase it the right way. And, and Robert's actually in his opinion, he kind of lays out a roadmap. Okay, you know, do, do it this way, don't do it this way. And the way Congress has done it here with Obamacare, yeah, that's good enough. We'll call it a tax, even though it was obviously a regulation and Congress itself called it a regulation. It, it, in the act itself, Congress refers, Congress refers to penalties, refers to it as a regulation of, of the purchase of healthcare of the healthcare industry. Um, but uh, Roberts made this, this huge mistake. Um, so Justice Scalia, uh, eloquently laid out uh, the problems with the majority's analysis. And this was yet another of Scalia's um, just incredible dissents. And as I've said in previous versions of this lecture series, um, he was the greatest writer of dissents. He, he was the greatest writer, I believe, the Supreme Court's ever had. And uh, his dissent in the Obamacare case uh, really just shreds the analysis of Chief Justice Roberts. And of course, there was a separate opinion written by, by the liberal justices um, and, and Justice Scalia laid it out. He said, quote, the question is quite simply whether the exaction here is imposed for violation of the law. It, it unquestionably is. And then he referred, uh, he pointed out that the law itself refers to the tax as a penalty and concluded to, quote, to say that the individual mandate merely imposes a tax is not to interpret the statute, but to rewrite it. Not to interpret the statute, but to rewrite it, end quote. And so uh, in summary, uh, from from Carragher in, in 1953, all the way on, and then reaffirmed in the um, majority opinion in, in uh, Sibelius, the Obamacare case, you've got the Supreme Court basically opening the door to Congress to regulate whatever it wants, as long as it calls it a tax, as long as the federal law is, is minim minimally revenue producing uh, on its face. Uh, even even a tiny amount of revenue, the court is likely to allow it to stand as a tax. And the and that means Congress can reg regulate virtually anything it wants to, even though Congress under our Constitution is supposed to be a, a government, uh, the federal government is supposed to be a government of, of enumerated and limited powers. This tax power has just been exploded and expanded to regulate almost anything. So look, I have no doubt that in a future, sometime in the future, uh, if there are Democrat majorities in both houses of Congress and there is a Democrat in the White House, um, they will pick some other area uh, that they want to nationalize the energy industry. They want to do something uh, that clearly that Congress doesn't have the authority to do regarding the environment. Who knows what scary hypothetical we can come up with. But it, it's almost a certainty but that when they can uh, control both the legislative and the executive branches, they will go to Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, and they will say, hey, don't, don't forget everybody, for those members of the Democrat Party who actually read the Constitution or care about the Constitution, hey, the majority in the Sebelius Court gave us a roadmap for how we can regulate whatever we want as long as we use a taxing penalty uh, rather than uh, a penalty of imprisonment or fines. It's, uh, it's pretty scary. It, it really is. And so while um, law professors and scholars who follow the constitution correctly focus on the commerce power because there's been so much litigation there and that's what congress has used uh to expand its authority for now almost a century um there really is a more dangerous problem i think in the taxing power because the supreme court ha has not adhered to the limits that the supreme court correctly set uh, way back in the 1920s in the bailey versus drexel furniture case and this has distended Congress's uh, authority to regulate way beyond what the founding fathers um, would have would have allowed, and it's astonishing to me that Roberts joined the act the, the activist liberal justices in this case, and um, I just think it's his his greatest mistake uh, to date in the opinions he's written. Otherwise, he he is 
by and large, uh, a, a good justice. He writes a lot of great opinions, but this one was a disaster. Okay, here ends the taxing power. And now we will finally go to the last area of the Constitution we're going to study in this crash course, or I, I, uh, I should say a last area of not the Constitution that we are studying in this crash course. And this is the abortion cases. Um, so we'll, we'll go through them quickly. I'll talk about some of my thoughts on them, and then we'll take your questions on, and you can ask questions about any of the topics we've covered in this course or things we haven't covered in this course. All right. So, um, the abortion cases of the Supreme court didn't really begin with Roe versus Wade. Uh, the, the real, um, you know, genesis of this line of cases, uh, was of course, Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965. Um, Griswold was a case in which the Supreme Court struck down a Connecticut law uh, prohibiting the sale of contraceptives. And Griswold was nothing less than a constitutional amendment changing the Constitution by a seven justice majority. It was in Griswold that the court magically uh, invented a privacy right in the Constitution. The word privacy does not appear anywhere in the United States Constitution. But in the Griswold case, uh, a very activist court, really at the peak of its activism, uh, came up with this notion that, uh, that, that it could be found in the Constitution. And here's how they did it. Um, the uh, Justice Douglas, writing for the court, uh, said that all the court was really doing was looking at the penumbras and emanations of the Bill of Rights. And uh, for those of you who haven't heard that phrase before, penumbras and emanations, uh, this is one of the most... Um, bizarre and idiotic forms of legal reasoning the Supreme Court has ever used. And it's one that we originalists make fun of all the time. That is that even if the the words of the Constitution don't say what you want them to say, just look in the penumbras and emanations of the words of the Constitution. What are penumbras and emanations? Well, Webster's defines penumbra <clears throat> as the partial or imperfect shadow outside the complete shadow of an opaque body as a planet where the light from the source of the illumination is only partly cut off a partial or incomplete shadow. And of course, an emanation is something that emanates uh, from something else, from a source. And so the penumbras and emanations of the Bill of Rights were the source for this privacy right. <clears throat> the, uh, oh, and, and don't forget to type your questions in the comments section uh, of, the, uh, of the Facebook program. So anyway, uh, Chief, uh, or rather Justice Douglas says, okay, Admittedly, the word privacy doesn't appear in the Constitution, but I am going to find a privacy right in the penumbras and emanations of other rights. And so he finds a pri he looks at the Fourth Amendment uh, protecting your homes against search and seizure and says, well, that's kind of like privacy. And so in the penumbras and emanations of the Fourth Amendment, we see a little bit of privacy. And then he looks at the First Amendment and says, eh, in the penumbras and emanations of the First Amendment, we see a little bit of privacy and so on. And he says, so therefore, I, Justice Douglas, with the, with the, the uh, votes of six of my colleagues, I am going to create a whole new right in the Constitution. We, the people, didn't create this, but I, Justice Douglas, am going to do it. And uh, in essence, because the Griswold majority was unable to find a privacy right anywhere in the Constitution, they invented a privacy right without the consent of we, the people. Uh, and it was with this privacy right uh, that they struck down the uh, anti-contraceptive law of Connecticut, which, which, by the way, was virtually never enforced in the 1960s. It was one of those old laws on the books <clears throat> that uh, was, was just, you know, lagging there and, and still there, but not really paid much attention to. Um, so so uh, as I explained, Justice Douglas does this on behalf of the majority, uh, doesn't rely on the text of the Constitution, uh, never explains how the uh, framers could have possibly, and he, does, he, he was an activist, so he didn't really care what the framers thought, but he, he never explains how the framers could have act, could have plausibly cr intended to create a massive privacy right, because think of what can come under privacy. I mean, if there's a general right to privacy that's just sort of free floating out there in our constitution, you could put anything you want to in that right. You could say it's a constitutional right to recreational drug use. You could say it's a constitutional right to bigamy. You could say it's a constitutional right to spousal abuse. You could say it's a constitutional right to a whole number of things. If there's just some general amorphous right to privacy in the hands of a, an activist court that could come to mean anything they want it to mean. Um, and, and that's why the framers never spoke in those terms, never said that, that you could, that the, there would be these general rights that aren't written. The framers insisted that the rights had to be 
listed specifically in the Bill of Rights. The, otherwise, if you just give the, the court the ability to create whatever rights it wants to, it could create all kinds of truly disturbing, um, even horrific rights. So, um, the, uh, so let's, let's move on. Uh, so that brings us to Roe versus Wade. So the Supreme Court has this precedent in 1965. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the pro-abortion activists bring, there were a series of cases that led to Roe uh, dealing with the abortion issue, but it was really Griswold that laid the foundation for Roe. So in 1973, Roe, Roe, the infamous case of Roe versus Wade was decided by the Supreme Court, uh, Chief, not Chief Justice, but Justice Blackmun uh, writes for the court. And it is in that decision in 1973 that the Supreme Court invents an unwritten right to the right to abortion, which is found nowhere in the text of the Constitution. And the court found it within that same privacy, amorphous privacy right that the Griswold court had invented eight years earlier. And again, even though the word abortion does not appear in the Constitution, uh, that didn't matter in their view because the word privacy didn't it doesn't appear either. All of these things are in the penumbras and emanations and in the imagination of the liberal justices. It was a truly scary thing because at this point, we the people had lost control of our constitution. These, these unelected justices were rewriting our constitution for us. Um, the, uh, there are so many flaws in the Roe versus Wade opinion from a legal perspective that I, uh, it, would, it would take too long to, to name them all, but I wanna just point out a couple of them. Uh, perhaps the biggest flaw in Roe versus Wade is the court declined to answer when a human being becomes a person within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment expressly protects a person's right to life, uh, liberty, and property. Without due process, you can't deny that without due process of law. So if the baby in the womb is a person, then the then an abortion takes a person's life with the consent of the government, with the approval of, and, and, and licensing of the government. And clearly that would violate the 14th Amendment. So the court has to ask, answer this question. When does the baby become a person within the meaning of the 14th Amendment, within the, that, that specific term person? Obviously, you and I, in, in regular parlance, we would say, of course, the baby is a person. It is a human being with, with it, his or her own uh, separate DNA, individual to himself or herself. Of course, this, this baby in the womb is a person. But we're talking in a legal perspective here. The, the court had to answer from within the, within the wording of the 14th Amendment, when is it a person? And Justice Blackman said, basically, well, people have different theories and philosophies about when personhood begins. And since nobody's really going to agree on when a, a human being becomes a person, um, we can't decide that right now. And so then he just moves on. But you can't do that. By not deciding, the court essentially decided. By not deciding that the baby is a person and saying, well, we just, you know, we can't reach a decision, it's too difficult. The court basically decided that the baby was not a person. And so it's this incredible logical failure that was one of the biggest problems of the Roe versus Wade opinion, a problem that even pro-abortion liberal attorneys recognized. Like, how stupid is that? You have to answer that question in order to you know, get to the result the court wanted to get to. Um, <clears throat> and another reason that Roe uh, was written so poorly. And, and I think when I say it's written poorly, obviously from a conservative pro-life perspective, it's, it's horrible. Uh, but just from a sort of a neutral attorney's perspective, the legal reasoning in Roe was really bad. And there were several, one was this failure to answer this question of when personhood begins under the 14th Amendment. Um, and then the other reason is that it, it, it imposed this a constitutional trimester framework on this unwritten right to an abortion that the court had just invented. So they invent an unwritten right, giant mistake number one, then they don't answer this pivotal question of when personhood begins under the 14th Amendment, giant mistake number two. And then number three, they say, okay, we've invented this new constitutional right, but this constitutional right changes over time 
it, according to the first trimester of a pregnancy, the second trimester of the pregnancy, and the third trimester of the pregnancy. And the, the strength of the right varies in each period of time, and the power of the government to infringe upon that right varies in each period of time. And so it was ridiculous. Never before had the court sort of imposed a time constraint and this bizarre framework on on, on a, a so-called right, when of course this wasn't a, a right at all in the first place. It was a, they created this new fluctuating constitutional right. Okay, so that's Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade sets off, as everyone watching this knows, sets off a huge social um, cultural war in America uh, over the right to life. And uh, the pro-lifers in this country have been fighting ever since and, and have lamented the, the uh, horrific killing of, of millions of babies in the United States as a result of Roe v. Wade. Um, but in 1992, something changed. Unfortunately, it didn't really change that much for the good, but it did change. That was the Planned Parenthood versus Casey case. Um, and that, this case had many people thinking, well, maybe the court's going to overturn Roe versus Wade because uh, President Reagan's uh, eight years in office had, had passed and President Bush uh, was in the final year of his term of office, and, and, and he had his appointments on the court. So you had Reagan and Bush appointees now on the court, and there was some hope at the time that maybe, just maybe, there could be five justices in favor of overturning Roe versus Wade. Unfortunately, it did not happen. Um, instead, uh, the court, uh, well, I'll, we'll talk about it. The court issued the, the Planned Parenthood uh, of Pennsylvania versus Casey opinion, which uh, evaluated a law that the Pennsylvania legislature had passed and a, and a pro-life governor uh, had signed and imposed various restrictions on obtaining an abortion. And the, uh, the Justice O'Connor wrote a 5-4 decision, uh, a majority opinion, that was a huge disappointment to the pro-life community, to originalists, to constitutionalists. Uh, and in her decision, uh, basically uh, struck down all of the uh, provisions in the Pennsylvania law, except one, I believe, and uh, so struck down all the restrictions on abortion, <clears throat> and uh, it created an equally bad precedent. Maybe not equal, maybe not quite as bad as Roe from a legal, you know, from a lawyer's point of view, but an equally problematic precedent <clears throat> that would continue this invisible, unwritten, unconstitutional right to an abortion uh, for many more decades. Um, now, the court was was keenly aware that the public was watching and that the public was, many many people were hoping and expecting that the court would overturn Roe v. Wade, uh, including me. And unfortunately, they didn't. And so what she did is she begins with this ridiculously complicated test for how the court should consider overturning precedent. <clears throat> because the precedent was, of course, Roe versus Wade. And all of the liberal attorneys uh, arguing the case and, and the public were saying, oh, precedent, precedent, you have to, you, you can't possibly overturn Roe versus Wade. And uh, those of us on the right were saying, of course you can overturn Roe versus Wade. It was wrongly decided. And so she creates this six part test for evaluating when a precedent can be overturned. And surprise, surprise, she applies her test and finds that Roe versus Wade uh, cannot be overturned. Um, but it was a, uh, it was a convoluted test and it was a test that could easily be manipulated. Um, the, uh, let's see, I thought I had some notes here, uh, about the, uh, I had some great quotes from, um, from Scalia. Um, okay. Let me see if I've got any good quotes here. Um, All right, so the first thing that Scalia does, and I'm gonna, I don't have the exact uh, tip. Oh, we've got some, uh, yeah, I'm gonna answer that question later. <laughs> I'm kidding, getting uh, questions. Let's, we'll hold, well, I'll take all the questions at the end. I wanna, I wanna quickly finish talking about uh, this opinion. Um, so Justice Scalia, you know what? I'm going to see if I can pull this up on my screen. I should be able to do it because I wanna share these quotes with you from Scalia's dissent, um, even though my, Apparently my printer ran out of paper when I was printing this out. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, Justice Scalia makes fun of uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's test for when we get rid of precedents. And he basically says, uh, forgive me, but I wasn't aware we had a special test where you get to kick out part of a precedent and keep part of it. Because what the, what the Casey court did is we said, we, we retain, we keep the central holding of 
uh, Roe versus Wade, but we're getting rid of the rest. And Scalia makes fun of this. Either you're keeping the precedent or you're not keeping the precedent. Um, but then the, uh, the Casey court goes on and creates this new test. So what basically the court does is they say, yeah, Roe versus Wade had lots of problems. And here we're going to put a new test in place to get rid of Roe versus Wade. Now, the first problem with Roe versus Wade was that it relied on this, you know, imaginary privacy right that the Griswold court had invented in 1965 and had based the abortion right on the privacy right. So one of the things that the, the Casey court did is said, OK, it's not really based on privacy. It, it comes from the word liberty in the 14th Amendment. Now, for reasons that we won't discuss right now, that's equally problematic, but it makes a little bit more sense than basing it on a word, word privacy, which doesn't even appear in the Constitution. The second thing the Casey court did in retooling Roe and getting rid of the more obviously idiotic parts of Roe um, is the court got rid of the trimester framework <clears throat> of Roe and rep replaced it, however, with a framework that has proven uh, equally subjective and equally problematic, and that is the undue burden test. And so the way the undue burden test works is uh, at the point prior to the viability of an unborn baby, a state after, unborn, after a baby is viable, a state may prohibit abortion. Prior to vi viability under Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, a state may impose regulations that do not pose an undue burden on the mother seeking to abort her baby. And the court tries to explain this further and says poses a, presents an obstacle to a woman who wants to abort her child. And this undue burden test would be the new test. Now, arguably, that did allow states a little bit more leeway in imposing some restrictions. But the problem is, what is an undue burden? It's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, the, and, and this is exactly what happened. Um, in dissent, uh, Justice Scalia pointed out how subjective the standard was. And, and here's one of the quotes of, uh, that I want to give you from Scalia. He said this, the, quote, the inherently standardless nature of this inquiry invites the district judge to give effect to his personal preferences about abortion. By finding and relying upon right the right facts, he can invalidate, it would seem, almost any abortion that strikes him as undue, end quote. Um, but of course, the bigger problem is whether you're basing it on the word liberty or you're basing it on the, uh, the word that is not in our constitution, privacy, there is no right to an abortion contained in the United States Constitution. And Justice Scalia's dissent pointed this out too. Let me quote here. Uh, again, this is Justice Scalia, another eloquent dissent. The issue is whether the power of the woman to abort her unborn child is a liberty protected by the Constitution of the United States. I am sure it is not. I reach that conclusion not because of anything so exalted as my views concerning the concept of existence of meaning of the universe and the mystery of human life, and here he's quoting the more liberal justices. Rather, I reach it for the same reason I reach the conclusion that bigamy is not constitutionally protected because of two simple facts. One, the Constitution says absolutely nothing about it. And two, the longstanding traditions of American society have permitted it to be legally proscribed, end quote. So as Scalia would put it, the court has no business enforcing so-called rights that are found nowhere in the Constitution based on the subjective views of nine justices, or frankly, on the subjective views of five justices. And he finished his dissent with the following words that I think still echo uh, through, uh, in the halls of the Supreme Court. Uh, he said, quote, we should get out of this area where we have no right to be and where we do neither ourselves nor the country any good by remaining, end quote. He was such a great justice. Um, our country had lost so much when we lost Justice Scalia. Um, okay, so now let's uh, bring us up to the status, to, to the present day uh, on the abortion issue, uh, legally speaking. Um, so we've been living for now for 30 years, nearly 30 years, under the Planned Parenthood versus Casey standard. And it's quite clear that Scalia was absolutely correct when he said that this test is inherently standardless. Uh, for example, in the year 2000, the court incorrectly struck down a partial birth abortion ban. I believe it was out of the state of Nebraska in the case of Stenberg versus Carhartt using the Casey test. But then in the year 2007, the court corrected itself and uh, correctly sustained, upheld a partial birth abortion ban imposed by Congress in the case of Gonzalez versus Carhartt using the exact same 
Casey test. So how did that happen? The court used the same test to evaluate very similar laws. And in one case strikes down uh, the, the ban on partial birth abortion and the next case upholds the ban. Well, both cases were 5-4 decision. And the real reason that it happened, not the uh, reason that the, the court tries to justify uh, how it could come to a, a opposite result. The real reason was that Justice Samuel Alito replaced Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was on the wrong side uh, of these cases. And Justice Alito had joined the court uh, and would correct her erroneous position on these issues. Um, and that just illustrates how Scalia was correct when he said this is a standardless, this is an inherently standardless test, this, this undue burden. It, undue, what is an undue burden is in the eye of the beholder. And he was right to say, look, this, we don't even need to have this test because there is no abortion right in the Constitution. We should be getting out of this area uh, entirely. Um, so in short, uh, the Supreme Court's decisions remain unpredictable in this area. There have been a few more cases since P Planned Parenthood versus Casey where the court has allowed states and the federal government to restrict abortions. However, uh, we're still laboring under this Planned Parenthood versus Casey standard, which has all of the constitutional problems that I've mentioned. Um, it will take a new case before, and, and it will probably take one more justice, in my opinion, before we finally see the day we've been waiting for, which is when the Supreme Court will once and for all overturn Roe versus Wade. I think there are at least four justices on the court willing to do it right now, maybe five, uh, but it will take another case. <clears throat> and if we have one more appointment uh, to the court under President Trump, uh, I think we can get there. Uh, but that's the that was one of the questions someone was answering is what was asking is, is when will we finally see Roe versus Wade overturned once and for all? Um, but I want to talk about one more threat that has emerged uh, in the last couple of years, and that is there is there is a new threat to uh, to unborn babies and to the pro life movement, and that threat comes from state courts that are activists, and we see it. Kansas is ground zero uh, for this pr new problem. In fact, in 2019, uh, a six to one majority of the Kansas Supreme Court handed down a truly disturbing case. Uh, that epitomized judicial activism in Hodel and Nauser versus Schmidt. And there the court uh, upheld a lower court injunction against the Kansas law banning dismemberment abortions. Uh, in this poorly reasoned decision, the Kansas Supreme Court justices stepped out of their proper role of interpreting the Kansas Constitution and did just what, like the, just what the activists of the U.S. Supreme Court did in Roe versus Wade. They stepped into the shoes of constitutional drafter and created a new new right that was nowhere in the text of the Constitution. They created it out of whole cloth, um, and they uh, created this unwritten right to have an abortion in the Kansas Constitution. And the Kansas Supreme Court was not the only court to do this. They were relying in part on a recent 2018 decision of the Iowa Supreme Court in Planned Parenthood versus Reynolds. And there were similar uh, state Supreme Court decisions to, to invent uh, abortion rights that were unwritten in the relevant state constitutions in Illinois, California, Alaska, and Tennessee. And what has emerged is, I believe, what is going to be the new battle over the, um, over, over, for the pro-life movement in the courts. And that is very liberal activist state Supreme Courts that are wrongly creating unwritten abortion rights. Um, so even if we get to that day we've been waiting for when the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey once and for all, you, we now have this other front where, uh, which poses a grave threat to, to us in the pro-life movement, because, uh, even if that day comes when Roe versus Wade is overturned, state Supreme Courts can create state constitutional rights that will still exist, state constitutional rights to an abortion that will still exist once the Supreme Court uh, overturns Roe versus Wade. And the, this, this is a problem. Now, the, there is a silver lining to this cloud, and that is that states can correct the errors of their Supreme Courts more easily than we the people can correct the error of the United States Supreme Court. Um, in all of the states but Delaware, 
uh, legislative action plus a popular vote of the people of the state can amend the constitution. It's much more, e it's much easier to amend a state constitution than, than it is to amend the federal constitution. And that is, of course, what we're trying to do in Kansas right now. The Supreme Court created out of whole cloth this invisible right to an abortion, even though there is no such right in the Kansas constitution. And so we, the people of Kansas, have the ability, uh, if the legislature will vote by a two-thirds majority in both houses, we have the ability to correct the Supreme Court's error and, and state in black and white, in plain language in the Constitution, there is no right to an abortion in the Kansas Constitution. Uh, and that's what this amendment, in so many words, would have done uh, that the legislature was considering in 2020 and that unfortunately fell a few votes short uh, in the Kansas House of Representatives. Um, so that is the silver lining, I guess, is that we, the people of Kansas, has the, have the power to correct our Supreme Court, just like the people of Iowa and California and these other states have the power to correct their erroneous decisions of their Supreme Courts. But uh, still, it is a it is a, a new front, uh, a new battlefront in the uh, litigation wars to protect uh, unborn human life. So uh, so to to wrap up your crash course on the Constitution, I have three <clears throat> observations, three closing observations, then we'll take your questions. Um, first observation. There is only one way to coherently interpret a constitution, and that is to give it the meaning that the people who ratified the constitution originally intended when they drafted or ratified those words. The, the original understanding of the drafters and ratifiers is the only coherent way to interpret a constitution. I mean, let's imagine that we, the people, um, draft a, con a constitutional amendment and, and pass it through Congress and, and it's ratified in the year 2020 on you name the topic. Um, if someone comes back in the year 2050 and says, well, yeah, the, <clears throat> this, this right to, um, let, let's call it a, a, a right to control the upbringing of your children, this right to control the upbringing of your children that they drafted in 2020, well, they use the word, they use the word, ch word children, but we justices in the year 2050 are going to say that children can really mean any person who's dependent. And so we think it also means the right to um, control the, uh, the, the, the future and the, the well-being of your parents because your parents are older than you, especially if they're over the age of 80. And, you know, you see what my point is? If you allow a court to change the meaning of words, then the court has assumed the power of we the people. The court is now amending the Constitution and taking away the power of we the people to amend the Constitution. So that's the first point. That the only coherent way to, uh, to, for any court to interpret any constitution is for the original understanding of the words to be the way the court interprets those words. This notion of a living, breathing constitution is nonsense. It's utter nonsense. But liberal attorneys and liberal law, law professors all across the country, and unfortunately liberal judges, <clears throat> believe in the notion of a living, breathing constitution, which means a changeable constitution that is out of the control of we the people. <clears throat> um, the second uh, point, the uh, concluding point is this. <clears throat> In some areas, uh, such as the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, and the Commerce Power, the Supreme Court has recently corrected the mistakes of the Court of the 1950s uh, and 60s and 70s and has turned things around. But in other areas, such as the taxing power and in the abortion cases, the court's decision today continue to stray from the true meaning of the Constitution. Third observation, in all of these areas, every single one that I have mentioned, the, the decisive cases, the decisions today are 5-4 decisions. They should be 9-0 decisions upholding the original meaning of the Constitution, but unfortunately they're not. There are only five justices on the court that consistently look to the original understanding of the Constitution. Um, and that means that President Trump must, must win the election in 2020 if we are to preserve and save our Constitution. And beyond that, President Trump must have Republican senators in the United, Senate, United States Senate who understand the Constitution, who understand what is at stake, who can ask the right questions of judicial nominees and can ensure that we do not put on the judiciary more activists who will twist the meaning of our Constitution. We have to have President Trump 
And we have to have a Republican Senate with senators who understand what is at stake and understand the constitutional principles uh, involved and will fight for them in those judicial confirmation hearings. All right, here endeth the course. We are now ready for your questions and uh, I'm excited to answer them. And let me close my windows here on the con this uh, keyboard. All right, and Molly is already ready with some questions. All right, Molly, okay. you gonna come up? Okay. Um, and tell me who the question's from. Okay, let me go to the top. Can the courts look at the 14th Amendment again and see if the subject you the dearest Jurisdiction thereof has been interrupted. Subject to the clear. jurisdiction thereof. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. Have been interpreted in, uh, correctly on citizenship. On so, citizenship. From Sebastian. From Sebastian. Very good question. Okay, so um, what Molly's referring to and what Sebastian is referring to is the words in the 14th Amendment that all persons uh, born in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. Now, the purpose of those words in the 14th Amendment was to clarify that the recently uh, emancipated, the recently freed slaves uh, were, of course, freed by the 13th Amendment um, and were also given rights by the 14th Amendment, was to clarify that they are citizens, full citizens, uh, within every meaning of the word citizenship. And so the, the subject to the jurisdiction thereof was uh, an additional factor. Now, uh, what th these these words are so important because the way the left wants to read the Fourteenth Amendment is they want to they want to just read those words out. They just want to say all persons born in the United States um, are citizens of the United States. But the the framers of the Fourteenth Amendment um, put those words in in the eighteen sixties with very specific meaning. And if you look at the uh, draft the statements in Congress when it was drafted. Um, the uh, subject to the jurisdiction thereof meant subject to no other powers uh, jurisdiction, no other, subject to no foreign power. In other words, you're not a citizen of some other country. If you're a citizen of some other country and you are physically present in the United States, you are not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. You are, all, you, you are actually subject to the jurisdiction of your home country. So you can't be a citizen of the United of the of another country, and be subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, um, and, and that is uh, that's what one of the reasons, by the way, why the um, more than a century old um, uh, oath that newly naturalized citizens swear is one where they renounce all allegiances to foreign powers, uh, so that they are no longer subject to the jurisdiction of a foreign power. The reason this is so important. Uh, is that this this myth on the left that oh hey if we if if we got rid of birthright citizenship that would violate the Fourteenth Amendment? No, it wouldn't. It would not violate the Fourteenth Amendment because the Fourteenth Amendment has that subject to the jurisdiction thereof. You are not automatically a citizen just because you're physically born in the United States of America. And so that's the uh, the quick answer to the question: Is it possible for the Supreme Court to get there to get such a question in front of it? Yes. Um, there are several ways that could happen. One would be if Congress would pass a statute that would end birthright citizenship and say, you know, I, I think the way it should be framed is it should be you're, if you're born in the United States and, and one or two of your parents uh, is a U.S. citizen or perhaps a green card holder, which is a permanent resident of the United States. Um, that would be one, or they could, there could be any number of ways Congress could get rid of the birthright citizenship concept. Uh, also, the president, the executive branch, has the ability uh, through regulation to get rid of birthright citizenship. I won't get into the nitty gritty of why that's possible, but it has to do with the way um, federal statutes on immigration currently frame this this question. Um, so, yes, a case could come to the Supreme Court, Sebastian. Um, there is no case currently on its way to the Supreme Court that I know of that would uh, address this question, but hopefully someday there will be. All right. Next question. Case at... Who asks? Tace. Tace? How does, how does he or she spell that name? T-A-C-E. Oh, okay. All right. Congress has issues passing any kind of budget, any chance of getting spending lowered and start paying off the massive debt. And she asks also about the likelihood of getting term limits. Okay. Um, well, let's start with the... Uh, Okay, let's start with the, the budget question. Yeah, so we have now 
of course, we already had a very bloated federal budget, and now we have a federal budget that's $2 trillion larger because of the you know, necessary response to the coronavirus shutdown of our economy, which is the reason why we're doing this um, on Facebook rather than in a live lecture, which I've done this in many lectures across the state of Kansas. Um, so the, I guess the long answer, to the, the short answer to that question uh, is it's going to take members of Congress who are actually serious about getting us off of this really now extraordinary amount of spending because of the need to address the, the coronavirus problem and get us back to where we were before the coronavirus hit and then cut spending even further from there. And unfortunately, I would say a majority of the members of Congress and all too many Republicans are not serious about cutting federal spending. They, they, they realize that they can just keep voting for these bloated budgets and no one is going to knock them out of office. And they realize that they can get elected in a, in a competitive race like the one I'm in. Um, one of my opponents wouldn't even vote for a 1% cut in federal budgets, federal non-defense spending. I mean, who can't vote for a 1% cut across the board in non-defense spending? It is so easy. If you're a Republican, that should be a slam dunk. Anyway. We've got way too many Republicans who think like that. They just are perfectly happy to say yes to any spending. They just don't care about deficits. Oh, yeah, sure, they'll give it lip service when it's election time, but they don't care. So, um, yeah, could, could we get there? Yes, but we're going to need more people who are serious, who will not only walk the walk, but not only talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Uh, for cutting spending. And I certainly certainly think I am one of those people. And there are others, you know, people like Rand Paul uh, in the U.S. Senate and in the U.S. House um, who are serious about cutting spending. But as we come out of this coronavirus period where there is obviously a, a great deal of necessary spending that has to happen in order to uh, you know, jumpstart this economy, we are going to have to have people who are deadly serious about getting back to the previous level of spending and cutting from there not saying that this elevated spending is the new normal. Okay, the other question was term limits? How um, is yes. Let me go back to the question. She also asks about the likelihood of dealing term limits. Unfortunately, very, very low. Um, I have been a proponent of term limits for many years. I also litigated and wrote some briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court on behalf of the organization United States Term Limits term limits. And so I've been following this issue for a long, long time, um, going on almost 30 years and, uh, and working on this issue. And unfortunately, to, to be perfectly blunt, um, the reason it, the chance isn't zero, but it's low because you're going to rely on the only way you can get an amendment on term limits is if two thirds of Congress, both houses of Congress agree to pass such an amendment. There is another mechanism for proposing amendments, and that's, of course, the uh, convention process where two thirds of the states under Article five would propose would call a convention. But for reasons that we won't get into here, because that's a whole we could talk for hours about the convention and that whole debate. Um, that's never happened before. It's, it's highly unlikely to happen anytime soon. There is a movement, of course, the Convention of States movement to try to make it happen, not specifically on the term limits issue, however. So for the time being, we're relying on Congress to propose an amendment to limit the tenure of sitting members of Congress, in other words, to limit their own power. And there are far too few members of Congress who are willing to do it. I have signed the term limits pledge and have said, when I get to the U.S. Senate, you bet I'll uh, vote for a term limits amendment to restrict the terms of members of the Senate and of the House. Um, but the uh, unfortunately right now, we, we don't have anywhere close to two thirds of the members of the House or the Senate who are willing, who have signed that term limits pledge. So the answer to the question is we're a long way off. I'm, I'm hopeful that we will someday get there, but there just aren't enough people um, who are willing to take a stand in favor of term limits. And I would encourage you, um, obviously, I would encourage you if you're a Kansan and you're voting in the, in the U.S. Senate race in Kansas, please you know, support me if you care about term limits. But let's say you're voting for a member of Congress in whatever district you're in. See if they've signed the term limits pledge. If they haven't signed the, the U.S. Term Limits Pledge, and it's usterminus.org, um, then ask them to. And if they won't, then that might be a reason you would want to vote against them in a primary or a general election. Um, Chris Dubert, what's your take on the constitutionality of the stay-at-home orders, including the especially and especially limiting assembly? 
limiting or not allowing to churches to meet and dictating which businesses may or may not operate. I think the, uh, th this is a really fascinating case that probably, well, it might someday come to the, it might come to come to a U.S., not to the U.S. Supreme Court, but might come to a state Supreme Court, although in, in theory, it could go through the federal courts as well. Um, and, and I've heard that there is one case that was filed in one of the Western states. Um, but yeah, there, there's no question that there are constitutional issues here. Um, if a governor or a, some other you know, local entity compels churches to shut, well, then obviously you are restricting the free exercise of religion. If a, a government order prohibits assemblies of people, uh, clearly there is a First Amendment problem there. Now, the Supreme Court has held for many years and really many decades that these rights described in our Bill of Rights are not absolute. In other words, there are some, it's the, the classic analogy uh, that the Supreme Court made about a century ago. You, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Your, your right to free speech has some limits if your, if your exercise of that right would endanger the lives of others. So you, although we have constitutional rights, they do have some limit if, if the exercise of my right endangers your life. And that's what the case would boil down to in the courts is that if there were a challenge to a, an order forcing uh, churches not to, not to meet, uh, it would come down to that. Is, is this, uh, is, does the government have a case that is so compelling? Um, and the, the legal term for this would be strict scrutiny. The government would have to show that it had no other alternative. First of all, that it was a compelling government interest and, and preservation of human life is a compelling government interest. But then the second thing the government would have to show to win this case in court is that the stay at home order was the least restrictive means of uh, promoting that compelling government interest. So just think about this with me for a minute. The, to, to win such an order, a governor forcing people not to go to church would have to show that this order was the least restrictive means of protecting human life in a coronavirus environment. That, that's a tall order. And I'm not sure that the government could win that case. And that's why I think it's really important that these governors um, not get overzealous in their in these orders they're issuing. And I think some of them are a little bit too quick to pull the trigger on these orders. They can, by all means, they can advise us, you know, it would be best right now if you uh, don't attend church in person and do it virtually. Like my church, uh, Morningstar Church uh, here in Kansas, we, uh, we, we do our services virtually. And we do our, uh, but that is a decision of the church internally because we've decided in the church that this is the safest thing to do for the timing. And most churches are doing that right now. So a governor can certainly recommend that churches do this, but when a governor orders under penalty of law that the church must not meet, then you start getting into this case of constitutional questions. And I think that there is a very uh, significant constitutional argument uh, to be made there because in order to prevail, the state would have to show, the governor would have to show that this was the least restrictive thing he or she could do, that there was nothing less restrictive they could have done to protect human life. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, there's no more. Oh, oh no more questions. <laughs> All right, great. Well, that is almost exactly one hour on the nose. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, the, this three-part series, this three-part crash course on the Constitution. Um, we will continue doing some, uh, some content uh, Maybe maybe some Q&A. We haven't decided exactly what we're going to do. Uh, but next week, tune in at the same time, uh, 5.30 on Tuesday. And uh, we'll, we'll have some other sort of uh, discussion here uh, at uh, the Kobach Farm. But it, of course, it'll be a discussion um, that will involve the, the Constitution and the rights we all hold dear and maybe some of the issues in this U.S. Senate race. Who knows? We'll figure something out. But if, uh, if you found this enjoyable, if you found it interesting or useful, please... Uh, let us know in the comments section and, uh, and stay tuned. Tune back in next week 
uh, we'll, we'll be talking again. So uh, stay safe out there um, and everybody have a great week. Take care.